welcome to the show. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you too. Hello uh, to everybody in uh, in Canada. That's and, the, that's uh, the Canadians oh, calling you there right now. Whoops! Oh, I got a phone. Go ahead. I'm listening to you. I'm going to tell this person I can't. Hola, Chini. Do you have a flip phone? I do. This is a, as my son says, it's a Stone Age relic. Is that intentional? Are you are you like you're trying to avoid the the iPhone? It's still, no, it's just it's still working. So you know, what's, why throw it out? Tell me a little bit about where this film came from. I heard it was a, a flight. Um. Yeah. Well, it was. It was uh, like any independent movie. It was hard for us to get the financing together. Uh, most any independent film, and uh, I wrote it in 2015. <clears throat> when I was at first, it was a sh- story I wrote on a plane flight at night <clears throat> after um, my mother's funeral. She passed away in 2015, and uh, I was just writing down things I remembered about her and things I'd heard from people at the memorial service. You know, met some people that I'd never met who knew her. You know. And heard some of the stories I'd heard from her and from other members of, of our family, but slightly different versions. You know, memory it, is tricky that way. It, it, yeah. it is interesting, hey, you know, when, when a parent dies, you hear another side of their story that, that existed without you. You know Absolutely. what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting, strange part of it, you know. Yeah, it can, be, it can be quite revealing, either because they didn't want to tell you the whole story or... Or because that's just how they remembered it. And that's, you know, obviously part of our movie story, in part because, as you said, Willis, the character that Lance Henriksen plays, is in the initial stages of, of dementia. So memory is playing tricks on him. But I think memory plays tricks on all of us. We, we're quite certain of, of the things we remember, um, <clears throat> only to find when we speak, say, to a sibling or someone else who was present at whatever the event was, they'll say, no, that's not how it happened. Or no, that happened at night or, or you weren't even there. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? Mm. We, we, we are so sure about it, but really our memories, we, we involuntarily automatically edit them to suit ourselves and our, our desperate attempt to retain our sanity. I suppose it's like sort of a self-defense mechanism. And you see that in the movie, that uh, dementia or not, you know, the, the son, I play Willis's son, and the father have slightly different memories of, of for example, Gwen, the mother, played by Hannah Gross, um, and just events. And so it's interesting how that, how that happens, how, how our memories um, really aren't that reliable. I mean, they're worth exploring, certainly, and comparing notes with other people. But yeah, so I was... I ended up writing the story. I wanted to remember all of these new things I'd heard, and and you know, when a, when your mother dies, you a lot of things come to mind that you hadn't maybe thought of for a long time, and you tend to look at a lot of photographs that maybe you hadn't, and so forth. And so I just wanted to record these in in a notebook so I wouldn't forget. And then I started playing with it. I couldn't sleep on this plane flight, so I. I ended up writing a short story of sorts, but it, it started, the foundation was memories or, you know, a desire to, I suppose, explore my feelings for my mother and, and then my father as well. And, 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 you know, what I've learned from them, good and bad, I suppose. And, and so I, it started there, but then I started making up this fictional family, which is the family in falling. So the foundation is real, but, but it quickly became a fictional story. And then some, some days later, <clears throat> I looked at that story again and thought it was, you know, visually, I thought it was, could be strong and I liked the play of memory. And so I thought, well, maybe it could be a screenplay, maybe instead of a short story or a short novel, maybe it's, maybe it's a movie story. I mean, it's, it's funny you mentioned that it's, it started as a, a, a something, you know, you're thinking about your mom and your dad and it went on to something fictional because I, I'm not going to lie to you. It is hard not to think about it. You know, when you're watching it and you see, I'm not, I don't think this is giving anything away, but you see at the end that it's dedicated to your, to your brothers and you yeah. tell, and you, you know, in, in reading about it, I knew that you had written it on the plane um, after your mother had passed and you see a son, you know, dealing with, um, you know, uh, an angry, uh, homophobic, uh, racist, uh, father or parent. It was, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It was hard not to go, my God, how much of this, is Vigo's real life, you know? 
Well, it doesn't really matter as long as the story feels real. Um, and as long as, and I have found this, you know, when I have been able to uh, see it, like say at Sundance and some other places, screenings that I have had for friends or, you know, fellow filmmakers, I've been very happy to find that people in general do tend to relate to it personally on some level. You know, sometimes things that are not at all similar, but in their, in their minds, uh, emotionally, and some things that are very similar story-wise to, to falling, that they'll relate it to something in their own family, an uncle or a parent or what have you, um, or fears that they have, you know, about getting old themselves or how are they going to deal with their parents and all those issues that are dealt with one way or another in the movie, um, that people, I mean, that's the best thing you can hear, that it affects someone personally, that they relate to it on a personal level, I think. So it's not whether it's entirely fiction or, you know, 4% fiction, it doesn't really matter as long as it feels real uh, with any movie. But yeah, there are some, the reason I dedicated it to my brothers, Charles and Walter is because out of respect, because there are certain dynamics, I guess, between the mother and father, for example, especially in their younger incarnations by Hannah Gross and Sverrier, Goodness, and who plays Lance Hen Henriksen's part? He plays. Yeah, he plays the younger, the, the younger flashback dynamic. version of the older man. Yeah, yeah. Their dynamic is, um, you know, there's certain aspects of it that that would remind my brothers of w the memories we three share uh, of our parents. So it was just out of respect, you know. But it, but otherwise, it's it's mostly not our family. But there there are certain very personal moments in it that are that they would recognize. Yeah. Why, why was this the story of all stories that you wanted to direct first? Well, it was the first one I could raise the fi financing, <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, I have mm, four other screenplays. And in fact, when I was writing this on the plane, outlining this story, basically, that became the screenplay for Falling, I was raising the money and had raised, you know, maybe third, almost half of it for another project, an entirely different story. And, and, you know, when I read this, what I'd written on the plane a few days later, and I thought, well, this would be a good screenplay. I said, well, maybe I should write that. And I thought, well, I can't do it now. I'm, I'm still trying to get this other movie made because that was the one I was going to direct. But I couldn't help it. You know, in any free time I had, I started writing this screenplay and I wrote it very quickly, much quicker than much more quickly than the other screenplays because it just sort of poured out of me and I had, I understood what the structure should be and it just went very quickly and it changed somewhat between 2015 and when we finally made it in 2019. And, um, but it was basically there. It's, it's not, hasn't changed that much. And, uh, I don't know, I was just driven to do it. And, and as it happened, the other movie that I was trying to finance, it fell apart. And so then I tried to make this one and I had it ready to go. We were going to shoot in 2017. I had Lance Henriksen, I had, you know, part of the crew and locations were already looking into that in Ontario and uh, Ontario province. And, um, and then the money fell apart, you know, just the person who was going to actually finance it, the entity, they just said, nah, maybe I'll do something else and sort of left us in the lurch. And I had to make my apologies to everyone, any director who's tried to, repeatedly to raise financing knows what that's like um, it's all it's all a bit surprising Vigo, because i i mean how do i say this the most respectful way i can i mean you're a very big movie star i don't i don't think i didn't think it would be challenging this like like you're saying it is you know well i mean thank you for saying that but one thing is to be known as an actor and another is to never have directed anything including not, not even a short so of course it's a gamble for anyone and uh um, so you have to, you do have to prove yourself that also the fact that falling as a story, <clears throat> I think it works well. I think it's a good story. There's a lot there for people to relate to, but it is a hard story in some ways. So maybe that was part of it. And also it just has to do with casting, you know, um, when I was trying to raise the money, sometimes people would say, well, why Lance Henriksen? If you would do it with someone else, maybe it'd be easier, so forth. Right, and, you're, said, and well, you're in it because of that, right? 
Well, yeah. And I, I said, well, first of all, Lance Hendrickson is the guy. He's the only person for it. And I just believe he, he's going to be great. And fortunately, Lance was able to hang in there and willing to, you know, from when it fell apart the first time to when we finally made it. And no, I'm, yeah, that's right. My intention was not to act in it because I wanted to give all my attention to the actors and, you know, and to the crew and just really focus because I had a, a lot. We had a short schedule, a lot of kids, a lot of different periods of time to to film. And I just really need to be focused on, on my game as much as I could be. But uh, in the end, to get the last bit of money to make it, uh, the condition was that I, one of the conditions was that I act in it. And even though I was reluctant, I, I'm glad I did it because for one, I got to go toe to toe with Lance Henriksen, who's, you know, a great actor and has a wonderful presence and voice and super intelligent person, very kind uh, human being also. So it was hard for him to, to play this part really to kind of let all that, ugliness out in a way or and insecurity and all these things. And it, I think it brought a lot of memories back to him of his childhood, which was quite difficult, but he's not a bitter person about that, which is remarkable. I, I, f I find it interesting that you use the word insecurity there, because just to be clear, if you're just tuning in, the, the film we're talking about uh, falling is the, the, the older man and sort of the lead of the film is this racist, homophobic, misogynist man. And he says, you know, horrible things to his family and he doesn't even type them on message boards. He says them, you know, right to you, you know, he, he, and he you, you play his son who is gay. Um, it's it, it raised the question of if if you began to understand because there's people like that in our world right now. Um, yeah. It made me wonder if you had empathy for somebody like that. And I, I I can't help but notice you use the word insecurity. Like, did you get get a sense of what motivates someone like that, of the worldview of someone like that? I think you get a little bit of that as you go on in the story. It's sort of a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, I I as a movie audience member. I, I don't like movies that explain everything to me and that underline everything. And, and there's, I mean, sort of the three uh, demands, it seems sometimes, especially in U.S. movie making, but it's, it's kind of an international thing, an international problem as far as I'm concerned, that often movies, and it's not just studio movies, uh, a lot of times independent movies do it too. They, the three things they always say they need to do is resolve the story, resolve everything, mm. uh, redeem, you know, resolve, redemption, and hope. And it kind of has to be spelled out. And I, and I, much, I, I enjoy movies that respect my intelligence and that involve me to a point where I sort of take part in the storytelling. I kind of piece it together. Now, why did the dynamic of Willis and Gwen, why did it, why did things go sour? How did that relationship go south, you know? And why is the father that way? As, as you brought up, and, and I like, and I think you see that as, as you go along. And, I, and to me, one of the main, the most important things about the story is that it's about trying in some way, some people try harder than others in the story, to find a way to accept the other person uh, and forgive them, but also to accept yourself the way you are and forgive yourself. But except, you know, I mean, you want that person to change, but you, but you, I mean, it is what it is and you have to kind of make peace with it in some way, as you see in the story. And it's not ideal, it's not perfect, um, but there are ways that people can show you that they're aware where they haven't before, where they actually see you and they haven't maybe seen you. And it's very hard to do when you have a, uh, you know, a father son situation, but it can be any friendship, a long relationship where you've gotten, you've got accustomed to someone not respecting you, essentially not seeing you, not accepting you as you are. Um, it's really hard to be open to that person, especially if they are hateful in their speech and their behavior repeatedly. It's hard to say, okay, I'm going to give them one more chance or I'm just going to always leave the door open. You know, I guess the question but, is why, like the question is why would you, you know, I mean the, 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 what was going through my head was while I was watching this film was that, you know, the idea that you have empathy well, for these people, you forgive why, people. Why does, why does someone driving down the road, you know, see someone that's stuck in a ditch 
and either keep driving or stop and help help them or see if they're okay. Sure, but there's a difference between that it's, and it's, a, it's an option. It's a human thing. But there's, but there's, there's sure, and I, I and I'm not I'm not I want to be clear. I'm not passing judgment on the film no, or, no, no, or no, on no. or on the characters. But it did make me think of like when you are gay and someone says uh, uh, something awful and homophobic to you, or if you are black and someone says something racist Repeated to you, it. what? Why would you like? Why would you? Why would you take that upon yourself to investigate it and and to, like? Yeah. I think I was just thinking about the limits of empathy there, you know, and what it does uh, well, to what it, it does to it, yourself. They are they are certainly stretched in this story. That's for sure. Um, why would you? Well, it's optional. Like I say, you don't have to stop for that person that's stuck in the ditch. You don't have to, and it happens. Some people, let's say, they have a parent who behaves abominably, or they have a son or a daughter who behaves just horribly, and they just finally have to throw up their hands and go, okay, you're on your own. I got, we have no relationship. We may be blood, but that's it. And that happens all the time. And I'm not putting any negative judgment on that either, but I think there is merit to trying. And I think in the story, as hateful as Willis can be, there are moments that surprise you where he shows some kind of compassion or seems to respect the dignity of, of, of another person. And by that, I was just trying to show that nobody is one thing all the time. I, I just don't think that's true. Uh, and there are moments, but you have to be patient and you have to be, uh, in a sense, as stubborn as that other person is about being intolerant, you have to be stubborn about being tolerant. If you want to have, that's the option. If you want to have any relationship, if you care about that person, especially if they're older, and they clearly need help, but they're unwilling to take it, or they show no gratitude uh, for a long time, someday, well, it's not really about being thanked. It's about because you feel it's the right thing to do and you want to, you know? I mean, it's complicated. Families are complicated. Um, Parent-child relationships are very complex, you know? The, the scene, um, and I don't think I'm giving anything away, but at one point, that patience erodes. You are patient yeah. with your father for all the homophobic and, and awful and misogynist and bigoted things he says. And then towards the end of the film, you're not. And you, you blow up in a pretty em emotional scene. You're screaming at him about everything he's ever said, and you're going to be left alone and all these other things. Tell me, uh, tell me. That, that, that scene, it's not really about what he's saying about me so much, because I've sort of developed a, somewhat of a tough skin about it, because I'm like, well, if I want to help this person, I'm gonna to have to put up with a lot of crap. That's just the way it is. And um, whereas my sister played by Laura Linney, she can only take it for a certain amount of time and then she is destroyed. Every time she sees my father, which is probably only once a year, our father, he just, he's got that bully mentality. He sees weakness and he goes for it and he just gets to her, right? And I'm a little tough, more tougher skin. So it's not so much about that. It's a cumulative thing, as you say. But it's, it's a lot about the mother. It's just he can't, it, it, the mother is the key. To me, the, the, the role played by Hannah Gross, in a way, is the sort of moral linchpin or the um, fulcrum around which our lives revolve. And a lot of the issues that Sarah, played by Laura Linney, has with, with her father and that I have with my father is about how he disrespects the memory of our mother and even confuses it with his dementia. It's just maddening, right? How, and so, yeah. how, how did you feel after that scene? Uh, I was exhausted. I think the crew was too. And I know Lance was. It was a very hard scene to do. And it was a scene that required, you know, on Lance's part, he was extremely, just throughout this shoot, but he was very brave about going to some pretty, dark places and emotional places, I thought. And as I alluded to before, he had a really rough, rough upbringing. I mean, his parents were tough. They were alcoholics. They were, you know, he basically grew up on the streets. They would go on a bender when he was like a infant and they would just drop him off at the orphanage essentially, or just like one, one I'll tell you one quick thing, which will tell you a little bit what his childhood was like. He was about five or something, five or six. And his mom was drunk one night and she, comes up to him sort of wildly and goes, he shows him his birth certificate and goes, here, 
and puts it in his hand. So you always know who you are. And then she turned him around and pushed him out the door, middle of winter, New York City. And then, you know, he was out on the streets for a few days and came back when she was, you know, whatever, when he was able to come back. And so this was a constant with him, but he sort of, he he's not bitter about it. He can talk about these things. You know, as we were preparing the movie, he told me all kinds of stories like this. And I was like, holy shit, I can't believe that you're not an angry, bitter person. Uh, it was remarkable. Did that, did that help you understand what we were talking about earlier, how someone can be so noxious, someone can be so, yeah. frankly, abusive to you, and you can you can come around? Yeah, it did help me to some degree. And I think it also helped Lance, which was really important, to access these feelings, you know, whereas if he'd been bitter and angry, he wouldn't have been able to or wanted want to, you know, go there. And so for this role, I mean, he's done almost 300 movies, 270 something, I think. But he's never had a role, role like this, which asked him to go there in that way. And so he was, I know he was worried and scared and nervous about it. It also is a lot of text he had and very intricate role with the onset of dementia going in and out of that and all his sort of angry feelings. So he, but he went there and he thought a lot about his feelings about the, his own past, his childhood. And he was very, very brave. And so after that scene that you were referring to, where we sort of went at it, um, it was grueling, but I mean, it was a, it was also a relief because in a sense, if that scene doesn't work, the movie can be good, but it can't be really good. You know what I mean? Mm. To, to, to earn what happens without giving away towards the end, that scene has to be, has to be strong and it has to be kind of raw. Um, and, and it, and it, and it, it, it is. And the crew really uh, gelled there too. That was early on in the shoot. And it was like, wow. I mean, what a, I what, mean, what a job for you as a director, you know, I mean, there's one thing to be an actor and come in and, and, and do your scene or whatever, but it's another thing for, for, uh, for all of the crew and for all of the actors and everybody involved in the, in the show, in the, in the film, to be hearing this sort of horrible language and to be hearing these kind of, like you said, the incredible darkness. You can't just step into it and go back to your trailer. You have to sort of manage it. You have to make sure everyone's okay, make sure everyone's feeling good, make sure everyone feels motivated when they're around some pretty awful stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, we felt, uh, I felt early on, I mean, I got to know the crew really well, well before, um, and we had a very good relationship. So I felt safe with them. And I think they felt not only safe, but fortunately for, for us, for all of us, the actors, they were really into the story. They wanted that scene and every other scene to work. They wanted every character to be the best it could be. So it, and it doesn't always happen on shoots, you know, where you feel like the crew is rooting for you in the scene, you know? Um, they're not just doing a job. It's sort of like, you know, if you're, you're a hockey team and you're playing at home, you know, it's that, that kind of feeling. W was, was creating that environment something you learned from a director you had worked with in the past? Um, well, you, there's a certain amount of luck involved. You just hope you, you, you've found good people to work with. But yeah, what I learned from directors like, say, David Cronenberg is that preparation is everything. The more you prepare and the longer in advance that you prepare every aspect that you can think of, uh, of the shoot, the better off you're going to be. You know, you're always going to have unforeseen obstacles and problems come up, um, whether people's mental state or health or on any given day. But, um, but you'll eliminate a lot of worry if you, if you serve really understand and everybody's on the same page and you communicated well well before the shoot um that's really important i i did learn it from from people like cronenberg and others who are, are really good at preparing their shoots and it was it was crucial i mean we had a lot of kids with limited hours we we're shooting winter hours which are short days obviously uh, we had you know snow and a lot of kids uh, different er, different time periods. I mean, it was a, it was kind of a. As I started shooting, I was like, "Holy cow, we really, uh, yeah, we're biting off a lot on a five week shoot." But it worked in large part because the crew was so had gelled so well, and because they were so supportive of the story that we were telling. You know, um, it doesn't always happen, as I say, but it did on this one, and, and our Ontario crew was 
was unbelievable. I, 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 I want to return to just to kind of two things before we go. And one is, and I want to be clear that I, I, I recognize and I respect that you, you know, you, films aren't didactic. Your film is not meant to say anything and your not, film's not going to tell anybody anything. However, I couldn't help but think about the experience of someone who perhaps might have their own racist or sexist or their own homophobic family and their own uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinner or their own comfortable Christmas. Mm. I, I, I wonder what you might say to them or what was on your mind about them when you were making this film, when you were telling this kind of story about those people. It's extremely difficult to do, but simply to not respond to hatefulness with hatefulness, to violence, with violence, to uh, superficial pigeonholing with superficial pigeonholing. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds simple, but it's very hard to do, especially if you have a very long relationship, if it's family, if there's a very long uh, dysfunctional <laughs> relationship with a person or a group of people have, uh, certainly when politics enter into the mix, you know, it, it's even more uh, lately, you know, it's, it's even more uh, volatile and it's very hard to, to do, but it's, I guess, no matter how much you want to just jump on that person or smack them or whatever, just try to listen, you know, take a deep breath, think carefully about what you're going to say, even as you're getting heated um, and certain buttons are being pushed. Um, I don't know. It's just restraint, restraint and take a deep breath before you respond. It's very hard to do. Where does that come from in you? Like, where did you learn that? Um, I'm not always good at it. I can, you know, if I see an injustice, whether it's personal or whether it's societal, I, I can get really angry and I can be very um, vociferous about it. <laughs> but I've, but I do make a point of making sure I try to redress it. If I realize that I've gone too far or someone has not understood me or the context of what I'm saying is not understood, I try to make sure that that person realizes I've realized that. In other words, apologize when you've made a mistake or you've, you've done the wrong thing. Um, that's something I learned largely from my mother, I suppose, because um, my mother didn't have a problem uh, communicating. My dad, you know, sometimes did and and it was kind of his way or the highway he wasn't really like willis is in this story mm -hmm. but but there were certain aspects a certain maybe it's from that generation you know that, that grew up in the depression and world war ii and all that stuff i don't know but just different times different masculine role models or nuclear family models parental roles all that but he was he wasn't he wasn't uh, out of pride and just habit. Uh, he was not someone that, that uh, had an easy time of apologizing for anything, you know? And there are a lot of people like that, uh, that, they, that they feel like it's, it shows weakness to apologize. And, you know, I mean, you can look at, I think a lot of people have related to falling because of that, because they see that in some cases as a direct, um, parallel to things in their own family dynamics or even society at large, you know, you see the family and falling is maybe a microcosm of, of a polarized society. And how do you, how do you pull things together so that there's more of a working somewhat unified, at least communicative society when things are really split, you know, and just like, just like bullies in a, within a family can take advantage of people who are weak or who can't stand up to them and create havoc and conflict and schisms. It happens in society at large too. We can see politicians clearly doing that in, in any country where they take advantage of the possibility for polarization and aggravate it. You know, people who, who can be quite calculating about it, who, who like to play the role of pyromaniac you know, fire starter and fireman. It's like, I'll, I'll light a fire and then I'll say, get out of my way and shut up. I'm the only one that can take care of this. And it's like, you know, 
that happens. That happens in, in falling as well. I, I, find it inter- I find it interesting that you, you describe it as not an opportunity for weakness. Bullies don't see an opportunity for weakness, but they see an opportunity for polarization. They see an opportunity to, to divide, you know. Yeah, because that keeps that allows them to, in their minds, to to have control. You know, if you keep everybody off balance and offend everyone, then they're not not going to get too close to you. But it's also, where does that come from? I mean, I think any kind of bullying or any kind of violence or hateful speech or action comes from fear. I think uh, at the bottom of it is is a, some kind of insecurity. You know, so you need to lash out just in case someone is thinking about saying anything disparaging about you, just if, in case someone gives you a disapproving look or you think that's what that is, the best, the best policy is attack. You know, I mean, it's preemptive, preemptive strikes seem to be the, the, uh, the favorite weapon of, of the weak and insecure. Before we go, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the music in the film. And there is there is existing uh, and beautiful pieces of classical music in the film, and there's a, a beautiful sparse piano soundtrack. And I, in doing research, I found out it was played by you. So I want to point out that not only um, were, did you produce the film and, and write the film and direct the film, but you also scored the film and, and played the music uh, on the film. So um, tell me, as a musician, how did you want this film to sound? All these things we're talking about, flashback, memory, who we once were, who we are now, hate, forgiveness. How did you want this to sound? Well, um, I mean, I'm not generally a fan of wall to wall music, just, you know, in movies normally, but it depends of course on the movie. And, um, and I'm not any more than in terms of storytelling. I like to have things underlined and have try to push people to, to feel things. I don't like that to be done with the music either. In fact, there's a, filmmaker that recently passed away, a great filmmaker, Agnes Varda, Agnes Varda, uh, French filmmaker, you know, really the godmother of the new wave in France. Great, great director. You were on a plane with with her and her daughter, right? Yeah, I was. It was like shortly before she died, actually. I was able to sit with her and have a three-hour conversation. And um, one of the things that she talked about, which I already believed in, but she put it in words in a very succinct way. And this was very useful to me in, in, in making Falling, I think. Um, and it's how I like to look at movies anyway and hope that they're made. She said, it's, it's really not a good idea to show things if you're directing a movie. Because I told her, I'm going to direct a movie. I'm trying to get the money together. Oh, great. Well, don't show things, you know. The important thing is to, cre- through your storytelling ability, Hopefully you will create a situation in which the spectator is interested in seeing things. Create something that interests people in seeing rather than showing them things, you know? And that was valuable. And I I feel that way about the music. It wasn't certainly out of a need to like hog the show, so to speak, that I said, well, I'll compose the music too. It was well before we shot. I, I, I knew what I wanted it to sound like, and I knew that it should be spare. I wanted the music to be very discreet. I didn't want to like underline things, but it should be, you know, somewhat bold when it needed to be. You know, I had I had some certain ideas of and some uh, of what I wanted some of it to be even before we were shooting. But then once I was in the editing process, then I understood clearly where I would want music and where I wouldn't. But I always knew that I wanted it to be sort of piano, be the foundation of it. And there is some guitar by uh, Buckethead. Um, this is a musician that I've worked with for many years and made a lot of records. And, and I knew what, what I was briefly to... in Guns N' Roses. Oh, yeah. He killed it in Guns N' Roses. It drove it drove them crazy. How, how I mean, he was instantly an idol, but he walked away from it. He wasn't he didn't like the competitive uh, aspect of it, you know, the way certain guitar players, no names <laughs> being, being, being named, but uh, that he just felt that eh, it was too much. There's this sort of macho competitive thing and he just liked to play music, you know, and that's the way he is. But anyway, yeah, I, I knew I wanted the score to be very, very discreet and it was easier to just do it since I could kind of hear it in my head than to try to explain I think to a composer, plus we didn't have any money left, <laughs> but um, 
to a composer and keep saying to them, no, less, 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 less. It was easier just to do it. And, and I, that's why we have, there's a song from Skating Polly at the end, in the end credits. It's really beautiful. And the lyrics, strangely, always felt to me like they were almost written for this movie. And that is piano based as well. So it all kind of tied, tied in with, with how I heard the, the, the score anyway. Well, let, let me close like this then, you know, between, you know, uh, acting and directing and producing music, which you've talked about. You're also a poet. You also uh, write. You're also a, a photographer. You know, I, I read something meaningful that you said one time that stuck with me. And it was some kind of interview you did. And you said that something. one thing, that one meaningful thing I said. When was it? That was frankly, in frankly, this 83? entire interview, I remember about three words in it that were very meaningful to me. You know, the rest of it. And like I said, we're going to cut out. <laughs> yeah, this interview is going to go hi Vigo hi Tom how are you doing Agnes Varda all right thanks a lot for coming on we'll talk to you soon no you, you said something that I really related to in an interview I can't remember what it was you said that I was I was interested I think you were talking about acting and you said something along the lines of I was interested in acting because I was ultimately very curious about how this thing made me feel all these different ways. When I watch a film, when I watch a play, I am moved to laugh, I am moved to cry, I am moved to greatly consider the world. And that you were curious about that, about how one can do that, and that's largely what led you into, into acting. So I guess the way I wanted to close things off was, do all those things feel like they come from that same well, like that same well of curiosity and, and creativity? Yes. I mean, I think... Well, first of all, I think that this, the kids don't do this. They don't separate amongst themselves. They don't separate themselves between, you know, artists and non-artists. That's something that we grow up as adults and do for some reason. And, and, and we shouldn't really, because I, it's how you listen to something, how you watch a movie, how you, how you look at things as you walk down the street, uh, how you converse with someone, how you view, read a book, anything that's, that's, living artistically you know it's just to me art and any of the me you know things that you spoke about whether it's music photography painting poetry directing a movie mm. it has to do you know some are more collaborative than others um you know i'm directing a movie i mean making a movie is the ultimate collaborative artistic effort but all these ways of expressing yourself creatively have to do with in my mind paying attention to what's happening around you and how you feel about it. In other words, interpreting how you feel about what's happening around you, what you see, what you hear, what you feel, and recording it or expressing it in some way. So it's taking it in, processing it, and communicating, even if it's just for yourself, um, how that makes you feel. It's a way of remembering, you know, um, it's a way of uh, it's a way of going through life, really. That's all, and and they're all they're just different tools for doing, as you say, the same thing. I mean, they're all branches of the same tree, which has to do with being present. Did you get any answers as to how art can make us feel? I mean, isn't this the broadest question in the world? But did you get any answer as as to how art can do what it does to us? By making falling? By, by being an artist. Oh. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know that I have, I mean, I, like I say, I, I don't, I think all people are artists, uh, whether they want to think of themselves that way or not. Uh, everybody expresses themselves in a different way. Everybody records what's happening around them in different ways. Um, I don't know any other way, so I can't say. I mean, I've always been curious about what's going on, and I've always been conscious ever since I realized when I was very little that our time is finite, you know, this happens to all kids at some point, very young, either because the dog dies or the cat or your grandmother or something happens, and you suddenly, you get this, you don't, you're not born knowing this, so you end up asking your mom or something, you know, are we going to die or are you going to die, you know what I mean? difficult questions for parents. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and my response to realizing that I, I remember it very clearly, I was very, very little, was not to be afraid of it, but, but to get, be kind of annoyed about it and to do something about it. Well, I better get busy, essentially. Yeah. Not that that was consciously what I did, but that's essentially my desire to explore 
pay attention, answer questions for myself through different art forms um, is about that. It's really about, okay, make use of the time that we have. Cause all I know is that I'm here now and I'll be gone at some point, not very long from now in terms of the history of the world. So I just want to do it and movies and making a movie as a director. I mean, I, I had produced a few movies before and I've always as an actor been curious and then in everybody's business kind of as much as they would let me asking questions of the director and crew members and actors. And the big difference was that in this case, I mean, I was doing the same thing. I was interested in what everybody was doing. And I was also responsible for what everybody was doing, being the director. But the difference was that I was being asked tons of questions rather than asking other people, you know, and that's, that's the job of a director. You, you got to answer those questions and you can't just go home and say, well, I'll think about it. No, you got to answer right now, mm. right now. <laughs> you have to, and I think it's best to say, I don't know if you don't know, and then just let's figure it out together. You know? But, uh, that's, I love that process. I love directing as difficult as, as some aspects of it can be. I, I really, 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 really enjoyed the, the collective storytelling um, aspect of, of the process. I, 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 I can't wait to do it again. I can tell you did. And, you know, sp speaking of questions there, you know, um, I think if, you, if you're hearing us talk about this film and you're looking for some kind of answer to all these things we've talked about, the, the, the great thing about the film to me is that it doesn't really give you one. And, and, and in talking to you, it does feel uh, intentional. It's lovely to talk to you. Thanks so much for your time today. You do. Thank you.